want to welcome you once again to LiveWire. I want to welcome those of you that might be watching online with us and, uh, and joining us online. And, and just again, just want to thank all of you for, for being here uh, with us this morning and, and glad you made it. I know sometimes uh, we can let the rain kind of stop us and, or, or just it looking bad outside and just looking grim, just kind of like, ah, this is good sleeping weather. And believe me, I'm with you there. Um, I looked out and it was like, man, this is great sleeping weather, but I just said, all right, I'm after, after, around one o'clock, after I've eaten lunch, then I'm going to have ma- my nap on the couch. But uh, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much for, for being with us uh, this morning. I do not believe for one moment up to this point and after this point, I do not believe that you are wasting your time this morning. I believe that God, I believe Jesus Christ has something for you and has already even spoken to your heart even as we started the service and, and will continue to do that. And so uh, let's get into the, into the message, get into the, into the Word of God, and, and let's just hear for ourselves what is it that God wants us to know, what is it that Jesus Christ wants to share with us this morning as a church, as LiveWire, but then also in our individual lives. I believe, again, that God wants to share some things with us. Now, the title of the message is Chip Off the Old Block. You remember I made this statement last week where Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, you're a rock from the massive rock. That's what the name Peter, the word Peter means. And he looked at Peter, he said, Peter, you're a, a piece of rock. You're a, you're a rock from the massive rock or you're a rock from the rock. And one of the things that we talked about was the fact that we are not just Peter, but we are uh, a chip off the old block. And we want to kind of dissect that a little bit uh, this morning. I want to kind of go back to that story where Jesus was talking about on this rock that I'll build my church. I don't know if you guys hear back there. I've got kind of a little bit of a ring up here. Um, but we'll, we're, we want to look at that story a little bit and kind of dissect it a little bit and just kind of get some things out of that that the Lord was showing me this week that, again, I want to be able to share that with you. But you've probably heard that statement before, maybe said of you or maybe said of somebody else that you're a chip off the old block. Or maybe you, you've heard this one, that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Or, or maybe you've heard um, that uh, like father, like son, or like mother, like daughter, um, you, you're, you're the spitting image of your father, you're, you're the spitting image of your, of your mother. And you've probably heard like some of these, some of these statements uh, before. Again, maybe they were said about you, maybe they were said about somebody else. And really what all those statements have in common is just the simple fact that we or somebody else is like somebody else. Either they're like their dad, they're like their mom, maybe like a friend or, or uh, another family member, or they're like somebody. And so let's look at that as, we have, as we are, we're going through this idea of being a chip off the old block. Uh, and as we look at this this morning, let's kind of keep that in the, in the back of our mind and we'll, and we'll come back to that. But we're going to kick off in Matthew chapter 16. And this is where uh, I made reference to uh, this story last week um, where Jesus is asking the disciples some questions. And so we pick this up in chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he asked his students, he said, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now the, the term Son of Man or that, that title Son of Man was just something that was given to, to, to Jesus by people. People recognized and, and saw him as the, as the Son of Man. And so Jesus says, who do people say the Son of Man is? Verse 14, he says, they answered, the students answered him, some say you're John the baptizer. Some say you're John the Baptist. You know, here's John over here baptizing people. By this time, John had already been beheaded. If you know the story, they beheaded John. And, and so uh, the disciples were telling Jesus, some, some people say that you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some people say that uh, others say Elijah and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Verse 15, he asked them, but who do you say I am? And immediately Simon Peter answered, verse 16, he answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Simon Peter immediately answers. He asks him first, who do other people say I am? Who do you say that I am? Verse 17, Jesus replied, Simon, and that was another name for Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed. No human revealed this to you, but my father in heaven revealed it to you. You are Peter, and I can guarantee that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it or, or overpower it. Now, we were talking about the church last week, and this is that verse that we were, we were looking at. And if you, you weren't able to join us, let me invite you to uh, go to our website, wiredalive.com, click on media at the top right, and you could watch that, uh, watch that by video or you could also listen to it online. You could even download it uh, for, uh, to, to watch it later or, or listen to it later. So 
here's the thing. Jesus, he gets his students together and he's like, guys, who is it that people say that I am? When, when you've, you, as we've walked through the towns, as we've walked through the city, as we've gone through the mall, as we've walked through Walmart, who, who do you hear people saying that, that I am? And, and, and then as he gets their response on that, he says, how about you guys? Who do you, who do you say that I am? Now, here's the thing. Some people, some people just, I mean, they need people to stroke their ego. They need people to, to let them know how good they are, let them know their titles, let them know what they've accomplished. Some people just need their ego stroke. I heard the rifle, and I felt the ball. You missed your shot, Cogburn. Missed it. my shot! You are more handicapped without the eye than I without the arm. I can hit a nice eye at 90 yard. That kind of been in front of them cheap shells on me again. I thought you were going to say the sun was in your eyes. That is to say, your eye. Some people, they just need, they need their ego stroked. They need to know, man, what, what, tell me what I've accomplished. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how great I am. This was not Jesus. All right, but some people need that. And sometimes we've probably fallen into, into that trap where we just want people to tell us how great we are, how good we've done, and, and our accomplishments and all of that. But this was not Jesus. Jesus wasn't asking his students, wasn't asking the disciples, hey, who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am? Because he needed his ego stroke. And nor was it the fact that on the other side of that, that spectrum or, or uh, on the flip side, it wasn't the fact that Jesus was suffering from amnesia. It wasn't the fact that Jesus was going through a midlife crisis. It wasn't the fact that Jesus forgot about his purpose and, and he forgot about um, what, uh, what, he was, what he was called to do or, or who he was. Jesus was not having a nervous breakdown. He wasn't having a nervous breakdown. He wasn't having a midlife crisis. Jesus, from time to time, he would, he would do this very thing as far as asking questions. And it's amazing when you read the life of Christ, when you read in the Gospels, and you just see how often Jesus would ask questions. And, and, and I always wonder, like, why, why did Jesus always ask questions? Like, even, even before, he would, before he would start teaching, before he would start sharing something, some truth or, or some type of life lesson, before he would start doing that, a lot of times he would ask a question. And the reason being is because Jesus always asked questions because he was always looking to benefit people's lives. He, he, he had a purpose with his questioning. See, it wasn't just the fact that Jesus was saying, hey, who do people say that I am and, and who do you guys say that I am? He wasn't just asking because he wanted the answer. There was something far deeper that he wanted the disciples to realize about themselves. There was something that he wanted them to understand about their, themselves. There was something he wanted them to understand about their relationship with God, their relationship with him. And so sometimes, uh, you know, God may ask you a question. And, and you're just wondering, like, where is this coming from? I mean, this is like way out in left field. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about how Jesus is walking with his disciples, going through a, going through a village and, and reaches Caesarea Philippi, the scripture says. And, and he just says, you know, guys, who, who do people say that I am? And I wonder if any of them just thought, like, well, where is this coming from? Like, why are you asking us this? See, we, we go through life stuff and we go through situations and, and circumstances in life. And, uh, and, and Jesus, in our life and even with the disciples here, in our life and with the disciples, he will ask questions simply because he wants you to answer your own questions. He'll ask you questions so that you can answer the very questions that are in your life that are on your heart, that are on your mind, something that you might be wrestling with, or maybe you're going through some situation or, again, some circumstance, and Jesus will ask questions simply because he's concerned about your life. In fact, 
we know this actually in today, not so much uh, uh, sports coaching, but life coaching. I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with life coaching, but similar in some ways to uh, a counselor, but very different. And what a life coach does is a life coach will ask you question after question, pertinent questions, open questions, like what, who, and when. They'll ask you open questions to help you come to the conclusion, to help you come to that, that goal or that realization of something you want to change in your life or a direction that you, want to, that you want to go in or a goal that you want to achieve. And this is exactly what Jesus did. See, every single one of us, we have goals. Every single one of us, we have dreams. And you may sit there and say, well, I really don't, Josh, I really don't have any goals. I really don't have any dreams. Well, they're there. They've just been buried for so long. I know how, I know how that goes. It's like you, you just, you wanted to, you had this dream for so long and, and it just wasn't coming to pass as quick as you thought it should or, or that you thought it would. And so uh, you, you, not only did you tell yourself, well, it's probably not going to happen, but maybe people started telling you, well, you're probably not going to be able to achieve that. You know, you're too old now. You're probably not going to be able to accomplish that. And so you kind of shelf that dream, shelf that goal. And now it's just buried a bunch among, amongst other things that are on top of it called life. But the fact of the matter is every single one of us have dreams. Every single one of us have goals. Every single one of us have aspirations. And the one thing I would encourage you to do, if you feel like you don't have any dreams, aspirations, or goals, I would encourage you to dig it back up. I would encourage you to move some of life's stuff out the way. Maybe some of those things that are just taking priority that shouldn't be priority. And to dig up those aspirations and those goals and those dreams. Because I believe this, I believe Jesus will ask you questions, will ask me questions about things that are going to benefit my life, about things that are going to help me and help you move forward in our life. That may be moving forward in, in my relationship with my wife. Maybe I'm stuck in my marriage somewhere. And God's saying, he's going to ask me some questions that are going to deal with, uh, with my marriage. I'm going to come to, the, come to the conclusion, hey, I need to move forward in my marriage. I need to change this in my marriage. That may be between you and, 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 and some other relationship, either boyfriend, girlfriend, or a friend, or relative. That may be regarding your finances. That may be regarding exercising, getting, getting this, this body in, in, in check. And maybe there are some things that God will be talking to you about. But a lot of times what will happen is Jesus will ask questions. And sometimes, you've, you've been around these people, right? They, they ask you questions, and the whole reason why they're asking you questions is because they want to get to that point where they can kind of make fun of you, or they can, they can degrade you, make you feel bad, or whatever, or, or berate you, whatever it may be. Jesus doesn't do that. See, Jesus is going to ask you questions because he's concerned about your life. He's concerned about my life. He doesn't want us to just stay in that same place uh, regarding our lifestyle, where we are in our life. He doesn't want us to remain in that same place. He wants us to keep going forward. And I don't know about you guys, but life has a real strong tendency of ruining that, doesn't it? Life has a really, a really, uh, uh, does a really good job of bringing that forward progress a lot of times to a halt. And that's why I say that we have those dreams, those aspirations, and those goals, but they're kind of buried on top of or, or un underneath all of life's stuff. And Jesus wants us to move forward. Jesus wants us to continue going forward. And so Jesus is asking his disciples, he says, guys, who do people say that I am? And then he says, guys, who, who do you say that I am? And immediately the light bulb goes off in Peter's head. Immediately. Immediately. I mean, Peter, right away, right? I mean, maybe even before Jesus got the question out, Peter begins to speak. And he says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. You are the savior of the world. You are the son of the living, the living God. Immediately, Peter speaks. And then notice what Jesus' reply is. Jesus replies, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed. No human revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. The word blessed, it means to be fortunate. It means to be well off. Now, I don't care about fortune cookies all that much, and I don't believe in them all that much. But, you know, when you open up, you order Chinese food, you, all, you usually get fortune cookies, and you open up a fortune cookie, and, and there's some type of encouraging word there. There's something um, there to kind of spurt you on or, um, you know, kind of move you forward and that type of thing. Well, here's something that's a whole lot better, and that's God's word, okay? God's word will make you well off, will make you fortunate, and God 
Jesus is, is looking at Peter and he says, Peter, you are blessed. You are fortunate and you are well off. And so I wondered about that. I was like, well, God, I mean, why, why was it that just because Peter spoke up and he said, you're, you're the son of the living God, you're the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Why is it that the fact that he spoke up, that he said that, that he had that understanding, he said that, why is it that he... He, he's blessed all of a sudden. Why is it that he's well off? Because we know that Jesus, we know that Jesus isn't just saying, well, Peter, I just want you to know you're blessed. We know that Jesus is connecting the reason that Peter is blessed with what Peter said. Peter made a statement. You are the son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the savior of the world. You are the son of the living God. And immediately Jesus says, Peter, you're blessed. You're well off. You're fortunate. So I, I, I kind of wrestled with that question. I'm like, all right, well, God, what, what, what was it that made Peter so blessed? What, what, what was it that made him so, so well off? One of the reasons that I believe that Peter was, was well off is when you know the Messiah, when you know the Savior of the world, you know the reason for life. You know the reason for living. When you know the God that created you and that created everything around you, you know life itself. You know prosperity, you know success, you know blessing. And so Jesus was simply saying, you know, Peter, you're blessed simply by the fact that you know, you know who I am. And in knowing who I am, you know what life is all about. And that doesn't mean that Peter had already all the answers at, at that point in his life. That just simply meant because he was connected with Jesus, he was connected to life itself. He was connected to purpose. He was connected to a reason for living. He was connected to the fact of knowing Jesus. He knew that he was safe and secure in this life and after this life, in eternity. And I want to encourage us this morning in, in that very fact, that because of the fact that you know Jesus, if you know Jesus as a Savior and Lord of your life, if you believe that as the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and you've said that with your mouth, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, the Bible says that you're saved. And in knowing that, you know the very life giver himself. See, nobody and nothing can give you life like God can. Why? Why? Why can't anything give me life like God can? Because nobody else is the life giver. He's the life giver. God is the creator of life. Now, there are, very, there are a bunch of things, and we'll get to this in, in a few moments. There are a bunch of things that you and I can create. We have the ability to create, right? We create music. We create art, we create cars, we create all sorts of technology, we create clothes. There are all types of things that we create and that we make. But the fact of the matter is, we're not. We may be a creator and we may have the ability to create certain things, but we're not the creator. In fact, anything that we create, we've got to create something out of something else, don't we? But see, God can create something out of nothing. All God has to do is speak the words. And you go back to creation, Genesis chapter 1. All God did was spoke. Light be, light was. Water be, water was. Land be, land was. All God did was speak. All he did was say words. Why? Because all God has to do is speak. God can take uh, something or God can make something out of nothing where you and I, we have to make something out of something. We have to create something out of something. So to know Jesus Christ is to know the life giver himself. It's to know what life is, is truly all about. Because we, we, we can get some really twisted ideas, can't we? If we spend, and some of you have been here longer than I have, but we could just spend time out in this world, and, and this world has a lot of twisted ideas about what life is really all about and what the meaning of life is all about. And it's, it's amazing to me that if the world had all the answers that the world proclaims that it has, if the world had all the solutions to my problems and the world had all the answers to my questions, why is it that so many people commit suicide every single day? Why is it that people are giving up on life? Why is it that there are so many people that feel like they're lost, like they're helpless and they're hopeless and they have no vision for their life and, 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 and just, they're, just, they're just going through the day-to-day, the -day, going through the motions, just going through day-to-day, -day, doing their, uh, their, their, 
the things that they need to accomplish, whether it's work or take care of their, their kids, but there's no, there's no joy in that. There's no, there's no enjoyment in it. They, they, they feel no sense of, of, of accomplishment in all of those things. Why? Because the world doesn't have all the answers. The world doesn't have all the solutions. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, you're blessed, man. He said, you're blessed because you know me. You know the one that can give you all the answers to all of life's questions. You know the one that can give you the solutions to all of life's problems. You know that I'm able. You understand that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You, you understand that I'm well able to take care of whatever it is, small or great, in your life. You understand that, Peter. And I believe that's something that we need to understand is that Jesus is on our side. And, it, and to know him is to know anything and everything concerning life. The other reason I believe that, that Peter was blessed when Jesus spoke to him, he said, you're well off, you're fortunate, is because he heard God's voice. He heard the voice of God. I mean, notice what the, the verse said, right? He, he, Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus immediately replies, he says, no human revealed this to you, but my, my father in heaven. He heard God's voice. And I want you to know this morning that you have the ability to hear God's voice. In fact, God's been speaking to you since you were a baby, since you were a child. God's been speaking to you. But oftentimes the question is not whether God is speaking, it's am I listening? Am I listening? Am, am, I, am, I, am I listening to you, God? Am I listening for you? And that's actually the question because God is speaking. God's speaking into our life. God is, God is giving us encouraging words. In fact, there was a time where Elijah was, was just at a, at a tough point in his life. The prophet Elijah in the Old Testament, Elijah was just kind of struggling. Like, where was God in all of this? And, and uh, Elijah is on this, on this mountain, and I believe it was like a, like a whirlwind came through. And the Bible says that Elijah said God wasn't in the whirlwind and then there was like some type of a, a fire or, or earthquake or something and, and God wasn't in the earthquake. In other words, Elijah was looking out for all of these different, these different um, big things that were happening and he was saying, well, you know, is God in that? No, God's not in that. Whoa, whoa, here's another big thing. Is God in that? No, God's not in that. And then all of a sudden when that was done, I think it was like three or four things that happened that Elijah was trying to see, was God in this? Was God in this? And when all of that was done, it was a still, quiet whisper that Elijah heard. And, and God asked him a question. He said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And the reason why God was asking him that question is because God had given Elijah some direction to fulfill some things. And, and Elijah just ran off, ran away from uh, the plan that God had for him. And he was just kind of stuck. He was lost, much like what happens to us from time to time. And God asked him a question in a still, small voice, in a quiet whisper. And he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? See, sometimes we're looking for God in the big things. We're looking for God in the, in the earthquakes and in the whirlwinds and in the, in the hurricanes and all of these things. We're looking for God in all these big things. And God's speaking in a still, quiet voice. And I know sometimes we wonder, because we hear voices, right? And, and it doesn't make you weird. Uh, we hear voices, like we hear things in our head, and we're just kind of wondering, like, where in the world is this, this voice coming from? Well, let me, let me kind of help with that somewhat. This is just something as I've, as I've uh, uh, grown in the Lord, just something that, I, that I've learned. Anything that is good and that is perfect always comes from God. Anything good and perfect comes from God. God only creates good and perfect things. Anything that is, that is evil, perverse, wicked, ultimately comes from Satan. So that's a great barometer for which voice is talking to me. You know, if you're, if you're hearing this voice of, man, you really need to just go over there and punch that person's lights out. Well, more than likely, you're hearing Satan's voice speaking to you. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that it's, it's Satan himself, but you, you've got Satan and he's got his cohorts, his demons that are around the world, that are fall, actually fallen angels that are around the world, and they're trying to, trying to get us not to, not only to... Um, uh, trying to get those of us that are Christians not to pursue God, and then those that don't know God, those that don't know Jesus Christ, not to even find God. That's their job. They're trying to get us separated, like we said, from the life giver himself. And so that's an easy way right there to know, okay, is it something good? Is it something that, that's perfect? 
more than likely than it's God. If it's something that's evil, if it's something that's perverse, that's wicked, then that's coming from Satan's camp, all right? That's coming from, from his side. Now, sometimes we wrestle with the fact that, okay, but is it now, it, I know that it's good, I know that it's something good for my life, it's not something bad, uh, but yet, is it God speaking to me, or is it my own voice? You know, we, we wrestle with that also. It's just like, am I hearing my own voice? Well, here's how you can usually decipher, all right? We talk about deciphering God's voice from Satan's voice. Here's how you can decipher your voice from God's voice. Let's say there is something that's good that you want. But let's say you just really, you really, really want this thing. If it's something that you desperately really, really want, not necessarily something you really need, but it's something that you really want, more than likely it's your own voice speaking to you. Think about if you could go right now, go to whatever dealership it is that you want to go to, and you could buy whatever vehicle, whatever automobile you want to buy, all right? Chances are it's pretty expensive, the vehicle that you want to buy. Like if you could get any vehicle, any automobile you want, you could get the vehicle, the automobile of your dreams, the truck, the car, Jeep, whatever it is of your dreams, or motorcycle of your dreams, or boat, of your dreams, whatever it is, more than likely, it's probably, it probably costs a lot of money. So here's the thing. If it's something that I'm just hearing this voice, and it's like, man, you really need this boat. I really, really want, I mean, just imagine the things that I could do with this boat. I could do a lot of fishing. Well, I mean, I could take people from the church also onto this boat. I really, really I need a boat. Chances are, the, pro the probability is very high that it's your own voice. The other thing that you'll, that you'll always know about God's voice is God's voice will always line up and it will always complement the Bible, His Word. Always. God will never say something different from His Word. In other words, God won't tell you in His Word, in the Bible, that He loves you and then you'll hear a voice from God saying, I hate you. Not going to happen. Again, that's from Satan's camp. See, God, anytime he speaks to you, it's always going to line up and it's always going to complement his word. It's always going to complement the Bible. And so there are some, some barometers there to be able to kind of decipher. Because I know, I mean, I wrestle with it uh, from time to time also. And here's another way that you could usually even uh, uh, another uh, thing that you could usually gauge that it's, it's the, Lord, the Lord speaking to you, that it's God speaking to you. And that is, you, you ever get on that train of thought, like you're thinking about maybe it's something that you have to, you have to accomplish today, work-wise, some things you have to do, or at home, some things you have to do, and you're on this train of thought. And then this thought out of left field comes in. Anybody ever get those, or am I the weird one? You get this thought out of left field, or right field, or center field, wherever, but you get this thought just flying out of nowhere, and you're like, what in the world is this? Well, there again, if it's something evil, perverse, because that happens from time to time, like this thought just out of nowhere. And that doesn't, it doesn't mean that you sin because you, you had some evil thought creep in or whatever, but that thought may come in, and if it's something bad, evil, perverse, wicked, whatever it may be, you have to, the Bible says, we have to take captive every thought and bring it under obedience to Christ. And so if it's something along those lines, we've got to throw that thought back out. But if it's something that's good, if it's right, if it's just, if it's pure, if it's holy, then the, again, the probability is very high that God just spoke to you, that God just shared something with you. Maybe he asked you a question, maybe he encouraged you in some way, or something along those lines. But if you're on that train of thought, and then this good thought, pure thought, honest, just, righteous thought comes in, the chances are very high that God just spoke to you. And here's the thing again, like I said a few moments ago. God is speaking, man. He's speaking into your life. The question is, am I listening? Am I hearing his voice? And so Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, man, you're, you're well off, dude. You're well off, Peter, because of the fact that you know me. You know the life giver himself. And you heard God's voice. You heard it clear. That's the reason why the light bulb went off and, 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 and Peter was just able to spit it out. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him probably with amazement. Jesus looks at him with amazement and says, Peter, you know, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Human, uh, uh, human, a person didn't reveal that to you. But my father in heaven, 
You heard his voice, and you and I have the ability to hear his voice. Never, don't, don't ever get to that place where you think that, oh, well, no, it's, it's just the pastor, the priest. You know, he's kind of got that connection with God and got that connection with Jesus, and only he could hear God's voice. Come on. No, God speaks to you just like he speaks to me. I'm no closer to Jesus Christ than you are. I'm no better than you are, all right? And so just as I have the ability to hear the voice of God, you also have the ability to hear God's voice, and the Lord will, will speak into, into your life. The other thing is, um, uh, immediately Jesus, you know, tells, uh, tells Peter, you're, you're blessed, you're well off, you're fortunate. Sometimes, you know, go back to where Jesus, again, was asking, asking the, the, the question, who do people say that I am? Who do you who do you say that I am? And again, we were saying how Jesus wasn't struggling with his, with his, um, with who he was and all of that, and all of that stuff. But sometimes we wrestle with that, don't we? I mean, sometimes we have the nervous breakdown. Sometimes we have the midlife crisis. Sometimes we're 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 going through a rough spell in our life where it seems like we're just we we lose our sense of direction. We lose lose our sense of purpose. And Jesus looked at Peter again. I, I, I mentioned this at the top of the hour. Uh, Jesus looked at Peter. He said, Peter, you are a rock from the rock. You are a piece of rock from the mass of rock. In other words, he said, Peter, you are a chip off the old block. And see, I think sometimes we believe things about ourselves or sometimes we allow people to slap labels on us. And sometimes we allow people to slap those labels on us of, of, of degrading, negative, and just awful labels of, man, you're too fat, you're too ugly, you're this, you're that. You're never, maybe statements, labels like, uh, and, and statements of, you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to accomplish anything with your life. I wish I never, I wish I never had you. Labels that are, that are just, that are just degrading, that are negative, that, that will, that will beat us down, that will beat us up, and, and that people may slap on us, and, that will say, well, you're, you're just an addict, and that's all you'll ever be. You're just an alcoholic, and that's all you'll ever be. You'll always be a liar. That's all you are, is a liar. You can never be honest. You're a liar. And sometimes we get these labels slapped on us. And we get these things that we believe that people have said, whether it's family members, whether it's friends, whether it's teachers, professors, co-workers, whatever it may be, a boss, whatever it may be, but we hear these things and people try to slap us with these labels and sometimes we get to that place where we just start believing them, don't we? Especially when we were kids and even teenagers, but if we never, if we never, if you will, untied or unbelieve the things that people said about us when we were kids and teenagers, I can guarantee you whether you fully understand it or not, I can guarantee you you wrestle with it today. I can guarantee you that you believe that label that was slapped on you when you were a kid or a teenager and because you didn't know how to deal with it, rightly so, you didn't, didn't uh, know how to, uh, how to get away from that or take that label off, and, and, and rightly so, but, but it affects you today. In some, in some ways, maybe you feel insecure. In some ways, maybe you feel like you're not good enough. In some ways, maybe you feel like you really can't accomplish the things that, that, you, that you want to accomplish. And I can guarantee that probably the root of that is somewhere in your childhood or somewhere in your teenage years or somewhere in your young adult years that somebody said something over you and kept saying that thing over you and slapped you with that label, tagged that label on you, and you've believed it ever since. And here's what I want us to know this morning is that Jesus has never slapped us with a negative, degrading, berating, awful label. Never. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, man, you're a piece of rock from the rock itself. He said, Peter, you're a chip off the old block. He said, Peter, man, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. He said, you're like me, Peter. You're just like me. I look at you, Peter, and I see me in you. I see somebody with the ability to create. I, I know that you're not me, you're not the creator, but you're a creator. You have the ability to create. You know why, Peter? Because I made you like me. And Jesus is looking out at each one of us this morning, and he's reminding us, 
You're a chip off the old block. You're a spitting image of me. You're just like me. I made you like me. I made you good and awesome. I made you holy and perfect. I made you like me. And it's so easy to believe the other things because we hear it so often. And maybe it's just something we struggle with in, the, in our mind that we can never be good enough. But I want you to know, man, God's not saying that about you. And it's time to take that label that's degrading, that's berating, that's negative, that's awful. It's time to take that label off and realize that God looks at you and he sees, he sees somebody, he sees a person that's just like him, just like him, that has his character. Yeah, do we always, do we always act, act like Jesus? No, I know I don't. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't see me in him because of, and really because of what Jesus accomplished for us. Because God came to this earth and he said, I'm going to die for the sin of the whole world. I'm going to die for everything that they've ever done wrong. I'm going to die for all their failures, all their mistakes. I'm going to die with it. And the Bible says that when we accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord of our life, it says that we became the righteousness of God. In other words, we became in right standing with God. So when God looks at us, God doesn't see sin. God doesn't see imperfection. God doesn't see unholiness. God doesn't see failure. God doesn't see liar. God doesn't see lunatic. God doesn't see alcoholic. God doesn't see addict. God doesn't see you're just a, you're, you're a mistake. I wish I never created you. God doesn't see any of that. When God looks at us, he looks and he sees the spitting image of himself. He sees, as he looks at us, he sees himself in us. And it's time, if you don't believe that or if you haven't come to that understanding, it's time to take off those labels that you've been slapped with because that's not who you are. Who you are is who the creator himself, the one who made you. See, nobody else made you. A human being didn't make you. An organization didn't make you. And so if an organization or people or even people that have said these things that maybe you can remember, oh, yeah, I remember this person's always saying this about me, always saying that I'm stupid, always saying that I'm lost, that I don't have a sense of purpose or whatever it is. Did they make you? Did that person create you? Then why in the world would we believe what they're saying about us, especially when it's negative? especially when it's something degrading, especially when it's something that is, that is just spoken to tear us down, especially that. Why would we listen to somebody that has no clue, that has never even created us, over the one, the creator himself that did create us, that formed us in our mother's womb, the Bible said. Why would we listen to other voices above his? He's the one that's the creator, and he's made you like him. In fact, Romans 8, 29 <clears throat> It says this, this is true because he already knew, speaking of God, God already knew his people and had already appointed them to have the same image, the same form as the image of his son, Jesus Christ. The same form. God looks at you and he doesn't see all that negative stuff. He looks at you and he says, there's, there's somebody that's a spitting image of his father. Man, like father, like son, like father, like daughter. The apple just doesn't fall too far from the tree. You and I are the spitting image of our creator. And so I want to close with this question. We're a chip off the old block, you and I. And I want to close with this question. What labels on me have I believed that need to come off? What have I believed? Maybe way back in my maybe way back in my childhood, maybe back to my teenage years, back to my young adult years, or maybe just back last week or yesterday that somebody just slapped that label on me. Oh, no, Josh, that's not who you are. No, this is who you are, Josh. This is who you really are. You're a failure. You can't do anything right, Josh. I don't even know why you even try. You can't do anything right. Who, who, who are you to even, to even have a church? 
Who, who are you to be a, a lead pastor of a church? You, you're never gonna, you're never gonna succeed in that. You're never gonna, you're never gonna uh, be accomplished in that. Things that we could hear and that we could just accept and we can just receive. Remember what I said about hearing God's voice. If it's something bad, if it's something negative, if it's something evil, that's coming from Satan's camp. That's coming from the devil's camp. But everything that's holy, everything that's just, everything that's pure, that's good, that's righteous, man, God's speaking to you. And he's saying, no, don't accept the negative. Forget all that stuff. Whether it's family members, friends, co-workers, forget all that stuff. Just take what I've said about you. Take that to the bank. Because that is eternal. So what labels have you believed? What have you believed that you've held on to? Let me ask you to close your eyes for just a moment and just kind of think about that question with me. Because I believe that God wants to do, I believe that God wants to heal some hearts this morning. I believe that God wants to change some thought patterns this morning that, again, maybe some things that, that we believe. And so just think for a moment. You ask yourself that question. Make it real between you and God. What labels on me have I believed that it's time it's time that they come off. It's time they get ripped off. It's time they get torn off. That is not who you are. You're not a liar. You're not a failure. You're not an addict. You're not an alcoholic. You're not a drug addict. You're not addicted to pornography. That's not who you are. Maybe you wrestle with something along those lines. Maybe you struggle with it. And I believe God can absolutely bring healing in that. But that's not who you are. That's not your title. That's who you are as a chip off the old block. You're an apple that hasn't fallen too, fa too far from the tree. You're the spitting image of your Father, God, Jesus Christ. And so, God, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just pray for every single one of us, myself and every one of us, God, this morning. And, Lord, I just pray, God, whatever labels we have accepted, whatever labels we have received, whatever labels we have believed that are absolutely, unequivocally the opposite of what you say about us, I pray, God, that right now you would just remove that label. God, I don't care if it's, if it's been on us for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and it, it's kind of like embedded in us like a tattoo. God, I know that you have the ability to remove that label, and God, we are asking you right now, Lord, would you take that label off of me? Would you take that negative label, that berating label, that degrading label, that awful label, God, that I have believed about myself, that I have allowed people to beat me up with? Because, Lord, I don't want it. It's not me. It's not who I am. But, God, I want to be everything, and I am everything that you have said about me. Just as your word says, I'm your holy and beloved child. I am the one that you love so much. We are the people that you love so much. You said that we're a, a, a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. And God, I pray that every single one of us, that we would get into the Bible, that we would get into the scripture, we would get into the word of God, and we would find out what are you saying about us. And so, Holy Spirit, right now, would you just bring healing in people's hearts this morning? Bring healing in their lives. I pray right now that people would just hear your voice. Your voice of truth, your voice of comfort, your voice of peace, your voice of direction in our lives. And we just thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for it. Now with every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you don't know this Jesus we're, we're talking about, I would love to introduce you to him because it's just a simple prayer. It's not a 10-step program. 
It's not a, hey, you got to get your life in, in order first before you, can, before you can even be saved, before God will even save you. It has nothing to do with that. Romans 10, 9, and 10 simply says this. If I will believe in my heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and if I will say with my mouth, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, it says right after that, you will be saved. That's it. And so if you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus, and you want to do that, you want to know that from this moment forward, that you have the life that God has in store for you, the very best life, not just good, not just great, but the very best life on this earth, and that you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to spend eternity with God. If that's you this morning, you want to make that choice, here's what I want to do. With every eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up. All I want you to do is just slip your hand up. I want to pray with you. Anybody, you've never given your life to Christ, you want to do that this morning. I see that hand. I see that hand. You can put it down right after I see. I see those hands right, right here in the front. Anybody else? You've never given your life to Christ. You want to do that this morning. Here's the second question. Maybe you know that your life is going in every other direction except toward, toward God, except toward Jesus. And you're just ready to give your life back. Maybe you got saved when you were a kid or you were a teenager or even young adult years um, or, or sometime in your life. But you know that your life is going in every direction other than toward God. And you're ready to give your life back to Jesus. You're not getting saved again. But what you're saying is, God, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to come back. I'm ready to come back to your plan for my life, your vision for my life. I want it, God. If that's you this morning, again, not going to embarrass you in any way, not going to call you up. All I want you to do is slip your hand up. You want to give your life back to Christ. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? You want to give your life back to Christ or you want to give your life to Christ for the first time? Anybody else? All right, right where you're at, you just pray this prayer with me. Right where you're at. Just say, God, right now, I give my life to you. Lord, I need your help. I need your strength, I need your guidance, and above all, I need your forgiveness. I thank you, God, for forgiving me of all of my mess-ups, of all of my sin, and I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Jesus, I believe with all my heart You are my Savior, and you are the Lord of my life. And I say that with my mouth. Jesus, you are Lord. And so, God, I just ask you to guide me each and every day that I hear your voice, that you give me direction, that you give me your truth. And God, I also ask that you would open up the Bible to me. And God, that your Holy Spirit would guide me each and every day. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for a new life. And I thank you, God, for eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus some praise this morning.